Let's go through the questions first. Okay. okay? So the first question is from Duruka. He says, in the Mahabharata, we see the fall down of great personalities due to pride. So how can one overcome pride and the poisons of Pratishta? Okay. Yes. Another one from Daruka. He says, in the Mahabharata, I heard a nice definition of non-envy. It stated that non-envy is always desiring the welfare and advancement of all living beings, rather than to exploit them for one's own pleasure. One should desire the spiritual progress of others and act to assist them in that progress. That being said, it seems that on, uh, not only is envy considered the ultimate downfall of the living being, but non-envy could be considered one of the ultimate goals in Bhakti Yoga. Would that be a correct statement? Okay, next. Okay, then Yoga Maya. Okay, we'll give you the nickname uh, Pandit, what's it, Pandit Mahabharat. <laughs> <laughs> Yoga Maya says uh, she would like to know more about the importance and history of the great personality Tulsi Devi. Next. Next, Kalki. In one purport of the uh, Sri Chaitanya in five features, is that the one? Yeah. Yes. Srila Prabhupada explains that it is wrong to think that Jain Vijay, the Lord's associates, come down every millennium to act as demons. He says that when Shishupal merges into the body of the Lord, he was not Jay or Vijay, but was actually a demon. Could you please explain what this means? Probably no. <laughs> <laughs> Who asked that question? That's Kalki. <clears throat> And then another question from Kalki. In Sri Guru and His Grace, Srila Maharaj explained the relationship between God Brothers and God Brother Gurus. He explained that sometimes God Brothers will disagree or chastise one another, but one will show formal respect when around his disciples. Can you please explain the proper vision and attitude of a disciple when he witnesses such dealings between his Guru and God Brothers? Mm -hmm. Who's question? That's Kalki. Then, Dhirulita Mataji says, Can you please speak on the art of sacrifice in bhakti? One may give himself entirely to the service of Krishna and still there is more to give and the sacrifice is never enough. It seems that surrender to Krishna is also an unlimited anga of bhakti. We could do an encyclopedia <laughs> on these questions. <laughs> Maybe the questions and answers should be given. Could you answer this question? If they give the question, I'll give no. <laughs> Any one of these is, uh, you know, there's uh, maybe a brief answer, or there's hours and hours, mm -hmm. and you need books and references mm -hmm. and uh, whatnot. Okay. Sure. Then Vraj Kishore asks how to properly cultivate honoring foodstuff prasad, and foodstuff means prasadam, without an enjoying mentality. Then the last question is Vasudev Prabhu. He said, if you take humility to its extreme, ignore the self and only look, look to serve, is that similar to the extreme necessity for Krishna where nothing else will satisfy the self than to serve Krishna? Say that again, read that again. If you take humility to its extreme, ignore the self and only look to serve, is that similar to the ex that extreme necessity for Krishna where nothing else will satisfy the self than to serve Krishna? Okay, I didn't understand the last part of that. We'll, we'll get back to that. Yeah. All right, so back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, how many questions began with how to or have that within the first sentence? Um, only Vrachki Shores. No. There wasn't any more how to's. Well, they were this, they were. There was one about. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Correct. There was one yeah. about envy. There was yeah, one about the root was how can, how can one overcome pride and poisons? Yeah. 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 Any. All, any and all the how-tos, how-cans are always the same answer. Uh, there's a there's a, 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 a pastime of Srila Sridhar Maharaj when he's asked how to, and he interrupts and says, a thousand times asked, a thousand times answered, always the same. Uh, and then Sudhir Goswami or someone was there on the side and says, Yes, a thousand times a a asked, a thousand times answered, but each answer always fresh again. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes. Yeah. So the answer was Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. Mm. Or, on the other side, Chant Hare Krishna. That's what this whole movement is about. All, all things solved through one simple process. All, all the troublesome things. Mm. And the worst thing you can do is think about it. Just, just do it. Just get on with it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, when you stir a pot of sweet rice, uh, do you think, um, oh, it's like Brad's driving a car. I'm going to turn left. <laughs> you don't do it that way. You just do it, right? You just do it. You don't, you don't think about it. Like, oh, I better push it to the right, push it to the left. You just stir it. You just do it. Understand? So you have a pro we, we have a process. It's all centered around the Maha Mantra. Never neglect that. Always do that. Everything else follows. When you when you when you face your Narthas and you can see one of them, whatever it may be, you know, I've seen a variety from anger to selfishness to the different things. You, sometimes you see them in other people. Sometimes you see them in yourself. Um, the worst thing you can do is just well, how can I, how can how can I, and then try to delve into that in some other way. Mm. In, in, in Bhagavad Gita, the three main enemies of self-realization are calm, crude, and low, lust, anger, and greed. So you can analyze these, they're all, yes, that's also symptomatic of envy. You could say they're anangas of envy. They are, they are envy. Uh, speaking of anunga, oh, that's right, maybe. Uh, only one is free, huh? That's the way it's going to be for years. <laughs> so that's the answer. All the how-tos are by association with Guru Sadhu and, and Shastra. And an overarching umbrella to that is chanting the Holy Name. And two types of chanting, one congregationally and one job by oneself. Or one can also do kirtan by oneself. But the, the idea of either by oneself or a congregation. So that is pretty much the answer to all the how-tos. So now read those two how-to questions first to us. Okay, so, um, in the Mahabharata we see the fall down of great personalities due to pride. So how can, how can one overcome pride and the poisons of Pratishtha? Yeah, so that's, there is no, um, how can you overcome uh, not being able to see, see yourself in the mirror. Clean the mirror. How can I see myself better in the mi uh, mirror? Clean it better. But in an example, you could say, well, turn on some light also, blah, blah, blah. You know, examples are not perfect, but they give the general thought. You have to remember that when hearing examples. You, you follow? Yeah. 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 The other how to question was about Prasad and how to. Have an honor without an enjoying mentality. Yeah, maybe there's something there are you know, and all these things. There's some like you can do's, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, like you you always hear Kunji Bihari say when, when I say, oh, very good Prashadam Kunji Bihari, very good Kunji Bihari, go, your mercy, Guru Maharaj. There's always little practices mm -hmm. that one cook that I met in 1972. And, New Vrindavan, some Indian gentleman, I don't, know, I don't know who he was or what, but he was engaged in cooking, he was a good cook. Mm. And he would say, if the prasadam is good, thank Krishna. If it's bad, please excuse me. Mm. You know, there's little mentalities that people can adopt, but also that can be very false. You know, I'm not attached, Prabhu. <laughs> oh, as soon as I hear that, I know that there's attachment. People who are not attached don't have to tell you, I'm not attached, Prabhu. <laughs> of course you can have it. I'm not attached. Whenever you hear that, they're attached. Right. It's, 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 uh, uh, it's Freudian, Freudian kind yeah. of thing. You know, it's, uh, people who are, you never hear Prabhupada say, hey, I'm not attached. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a symptom of attachment. So people can pretend to be humble by trying to be humble. And they're not. They're just pretending to be. And that's not humility. Still, the Anarthas are are there. The guy who shot Gandhi in the chest and killed him, shot him three times. First offered namaskars, and then pulled up the gun and bam, 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 shot him three times in the chest. So what is he went through the motions? What is the meaning of um, Dundabad's Mahatmaji? Then he shoots and kills him. So he's pretending. So you can't artificially do these things. You, you can, but they're of little benefit. Um, I remember once I was, I was attacked by a group of 
of uh, devotees with rocks. Well, they weren't rocks, they were hard dirt claws on the bank of the Ganges. It was by a group of devotee, by one Swami and his group of, you know, redneck brahmacharis. And they, they thought it was, uh, they were having water fights and doing all these things. They thought it was humorous that I was uh, a little more sober and I was sitting off to the side and I was saying my Gayatri and I was chanting. So they, uh, they attacked me with dirt clods. And uh, I got so angry, I just walked through the bunch of them uh, at the pack leader who was standing on the other side. And I had, I'm going to kill you in my eyes. And the dirt clods were going boom, boom. Even one of them hit me in the, in the head. And, and I had such a look. And I think my eyes kind of swelled up almost like with tears, not from pain, but from anger. And as I walked towards the creep, um, that's a hint to his name, he goes, let's go! And he called his boys and they all ran away. So for not going back to the Mayapur project and literally, literally going and getting one of my knives and killing this SOB, I sat down on the bank of the Ganges and chanting Hare Krishna so loud you could have heard me in Nabadweep. I was screaming the holy name, to try and control my anger. I was quite a <laughs> feisty little guy. <laughs> so that was some endeavor, but I was endeavoring to chant the holy name. You know, I don't know how much the holy name helped me at that moment, but after sitting there literally shouting as loud as I could shout, uh, you know, some of that passion, that energy went away. So, I employed shouting along with chanting. So sometimes there are, there are things you can do, you know. If, if you realize you're, you're greedy, uh, then you can practice giving in charity. Like, there was this one person, it's hard to say these people were even devotees, because someone really sent a quote around, uh, I, did, I didn't look at it much, but it was from Srila Prabhupada. He said, there are many rascals and demons in the Hare Krishna movement, and these people should be weeded out. Mm. Did, you, did you get I, that? I think I did see that, yeah. And, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't spend much time on that, but I was aware of that before. So th there was this one devotee, he used to invite devotees uh, to his house to celebrate some festival. You know, and it, they were all, all devotees. At that time, all, I think all disciples of Srila Prabhupada living in Hawaii, in this island, you know, in the middle of the Pacific. No temple, just people living in their houses and stuff. So they would celebrate. And he would invite people to come. And, and, and of course, then would have to be the menu would be sorted out. Some of the mothers were really good cooks. Some of the men were really good cooks. And he'd go, I'll, 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 I'll do the rice. And so he prepared to do the rice. Now that's just about the cheapest thing that you can do at a feast is a pot of rice. So he would volunteer to do the rice. And in some of these prep these feast preparations, uh, some of these feasts, the amount of devotees and everything, there would be like 25 or 30 preparations between all the devotees. And in the hustle and the bustle of the serving out the feast after the kirtan, after I give the lecture, he would start stealing parts of the prashadam. If it was pakoras, he'd get a bag and throw a half a dozen pakoras in here, tie up the bag and uh, walk into his son's bedroom and put him in his closet up on a shelf. And, uh, and he would do this successfully without any, anybody noticing until one day he stole the whole plate of, it was like a blueberry sand dish Miss Chinta's wife had made. Anutama, and, and Keshava, the old Keshava, Karandar's brother, was sitting, was sitting next to me, and we're taking Prashadam. Anutama comes and says, Omaras, did you get some of the blueberry sandesh? And I said, no, I don't think it did. And so she goes off to the kitchen area, and, and there's pots and things all over, and she's going all over the place. She's looking, she goes, and then she goes out the back door and goes out to her car. Maybe she left it in the car. And she comes back in. She goes, I can't find it. I don't know where. 
where it is, you know, and that kind of, kind of just went on, you know. She's like, whoa, well, maybe I left it at home, right? And then Keshav gets up and he goes, he sees this devotee go into his son's room. Keshav gets up and he walks over there and he goes in behind him. And there's the, there he is, like, oh, caught with the goods, right? So he pulls out this little pan of blueberry sandwiches and he brings it back out. And I was like, what's he doing in that room? He goes, oh, he steals a little bit of everything. You know? That is uh, very greedy, very lusty person. So, and another time at his house, I was personally invited. And as we came in through the kitchen door, I just kind of looked and there was a pan of a stir-fried subji with paneer, mm. but it was like kind of pushed to one half of the pan. Half the pan was empty. Mm. And I just I just noticed that. I'm observing observant. You know. I just I just noticed that. And we sat down for a prashadam and it was really nice. It was just uh, his son had cooked. It was a there was this one paneer stir-fried stir eggplant subji or something. I forget exactly what it was. And uh, we're taking uh, prasadam and everything, and then uh, uh, you know, they say, so, Maharaj, would you, you like anything else? And Vishnu Maharaj goes, Yeah, I like a little more of that uh, stir fried uh, paneer saji. <laughs> and he goes, Oh, I I'm sorry, but that's all gone. Right? <laughs> and, and then I realized there was only a half a plate because after his son cooked it, he took half of it away and packed it in a thing and hid it in the refrigerator. I mean, this man was diseased with, with this kind of a, a greed. Uh, later, just for the story, he stole $110,000 from me. So some people's greed cannot be uh, satiated. satiated. It cannot be purified even. He's a devotee chanting his 16 rounds every day, supposedly, or whatever. So it's not that just just chant. It's not just. That just we replace with avoiding the 10 offenses and, 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 and how, the, the better the how-to uh, chant sincerely. That's a very delicate how-to question. But again, it goes back to <coughs> Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. We have to associate with, with excuse me, <clears throat> with that which is already pure. If we don't, well then we're chanting, but our anarthas are everywhere in our chanting. So isolated chanting, going, going off alone somewhere and chanting in a cave and, and just, just, just taking the holy name, well, that might not serve you so well. We need a better association. Uh, Paramahansa can go off and chant alone, uh, but uh, then the, not be uh, overwhelmed. The creepers of Anarthas will not come creeping back in. But for those who are striving for purification, association is just about the most important thing. But in general, all the other how-tos, how-tos, they're all the same answer. Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra, and the Holy Name. Yeah. Is that all right? Yes. Whose question was that? That was the Rukha Okay. Next one was, and the, about uh, his how-to about Prashadam, um, <clears throat> Mahaprabhu tells, uh, this, this he, he takes something. Well, I don't know what it was. It might have been shock. It might have been a sweet. But he says, oh, this prasadam is very sweet because it is uh, touched by the lips of Krishna. So remembrance in doing what you're doing. For example, in the early, early days, there was a story. Uh, Satsarup Maharaj, who was just a, a new devotee, and he's typing manuscripts for Prabhupada, and he comes to his apartment uh, behind or wherever it was, uh, either 26th at 2nd Avenue or maybe even before they got that place where he was staying. And he comes and knocks on his door, Prabhupada opens his door and he's got a typed manuscript. I don't know how big it was, it wasn't a whole book, it was like a, some some amount of paper, standard different paper. Then he goes, 
here. Like a delivery boy. Here's your package. Here's your manuscript. Prophet takes hold of the manuscript and he says, no, no, not like that. I love you and you love me. <laughs> That's the way he expressed it. These are the days of the hippies and the love movement and everything. In other words, he was just doing it and like, here it is. No, it's not just here it is. It has to be, it has to be with devotion, here it is. You see. By the same token, another man came to his door and offered Srila Prabhupada a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, well, thank you very much. And another guy from the area of the village came and offered, they assume, I think it was pumpkin pie. They came and offered Prabhupada. So they're offering. They have no calculation. One guy is uh, kind of almost like a homeless guy. He's, he wants to give, somehow he's impressed, he wants to give something. And all he's got is a roll. Right? roll. <laughs> and he gives this to Prabhupada. And the other person had something, his wife cooked or something, and he just felt he wanted to give. But it probably had eggs in it or something like this. Prabhupada says, thank you very much. No one ever saw him eat it. No one ever saw him throw it away. But he accepted that devotion. So that particular time, maybe, we can say that when this devotee came and said, here, Prabhupada just says, he sees that oh, this is just a mechanical thing he's doing. It's not like that. There must be devotion. So you honor prasadam, we don't eat prasadam. Uh, we used to protect ourselves from these things by selected vocabulary also. You didn't, uh, you didn't say, uh, uh, you know, you would say, uh, oh, Prabhu, would you like to honor some prasadam? You would say, oh, would you like to eat? Mm -hmm. Eating is a mundane thing. Animals eat, people eat, they devour, eat. So we so sometimes selective vocabulary. Money, we never called money. It was always Lakshmi. Lakshmi is, the, the, is wealth and Lakshmi belongs to Krishna consort of Krishna. So all money, we never used that word money, never. Uh, I used to take the Lakshmi to the bank in New York every Monday was at least a $13,000 deposit. Again on, on, on Friday morning before the weekend and that would be about another four or five. It was a Lakshmi deposit. Uh, but it seems that even sometimes choice of words doesn't protect somebody. We called each other Prabhus. Prabhu means masters. Well, duh, there's a big history where this Prabhu killed that Prabhu and two other Prabhus, and this Prabhu killed that Prabhu, and this Prabhu stole that Prabhu's wife, so it really didn't make a bit of difference. If you're not put if you're not putting sincerity into that. So just and then it just became vocab in the beginning was I think it was very uh, everybody was conscious. There were fewer people. It was easy to be conscious about what you were doing. The movement was moving forward, but not in any gargantuan speed. You know, no, no, like you know, super speed. And then the speed picked up, and with the speed that picked up, and more people picked up, and more money picked up. Many of the words stuck, but the sincerity required behind them and the real meaning of things just went to the to the wayside. And until like that video we did called Ecstatic Cure, what was it called? Qualification of Cure Time. Yeah. Yeah. You saw that. that. That's a Swami in the beginning. You know? I have a sense of humor and I'll, I'll joke around with you and be humorous and, and so, uh, so many things, but you're never going to see me dress in the dress of a sannyasi and wear some bunny rabbit shoes and some dumbass looking donkey hat or something and then put a picture of Jagannath on top of it. That is absolutely ridiculous. That is, and I'm discussing, was it this morning? Last or yesterday? Yesterday, yesterday with one of the ISKCON GVCs, we Skyped, and that came up. And he tried to defend the whole, the whole scenario of those kirtans, and saying, well, you know, when Prabhupada was here, things did, got a little ecstatic and they got out of control. And I said, yes, but he corrected them because that wasn't ecstatic. I said, that was ridiculous. And when you get when a swami gets down and quacks like a duck in the middle of a kirtan or performs a mock bullfight, this is not a call that's ecstatic kirtan. And he's going, well, I said, well, well, hell, this is nonsense. 
This is not ecstatic kirtan. But this this word ecstatic kirtan, this is carried over, and it 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 just applies to any kooky thing that you can do. Get all the girls beautifully dressed and painted up, and then get them all choreographing a kir kirtan. This isn't a choir, right? This isn't some Broadway drama musical, but that's the way they're doing it. And it's attracting people, right? With the spirit of enjoyment. It's just sucking in. You can enjoy Krishna. Come on, come on. You can enjoy. Enjoy, enjoy. And the guys look pretty dumpy. If you want some, want some of those kirtans, the girls go by like, wow, wow, this is great. Who are those dudes? Playing the drum, just some dumpy looking guy with a sweatshirt. Not, where do they figure out how to start dressing these guys up? I don't know what they'll put them in. <laughs> also, they have t-shirts or something. Tattoos. <laughs> so, they're... Uh, like conscious cleaners, cut some, put some consciousness into it, some remembrance into it. Prashadam is not just satisfying one's hunger, filling, filling the belly. We do do that in order to do our service, you know. Um, we eat and we don't eat or, or whatever it is uh, in, in, in order to do our service. And we may not always be thinking, oh, this, this palamita is touched by the lips of Krishna. It's like, what? Well, when did he touch it? He just cooked it. He gave it to me. <laughs> this is necessity. This is like, okay, we're Krishna's mercy out of this necessity. And then there's prasadam, food that is offered to Krishna. That's different. One gives you strength to do your service. The other is purifying. There's, there's a difference. But Srila Prabhupada, he writes, for example, one of these says, devotees don't like to eat in restaurants. He didn't say devotees don't eat in restaurants. He ate in restaurants throughout his life. He traveled around India. He traveled on trains. Uh, I mean, what did he do? Fast for two weeks when he was out selling his um, pharmaceutical products. He traveled to South India, sometimes going two or three weeks. He didn't eat in a restaurant. He said they, devotees don't like to eat in a restaurant. So de devotees, really, I mean, amongst householders for camaraderie and friendship, sometimes, like in Mexico, the devotees will go out to somewhere they've gone a few times, you know, uh, to, a, to a restaurant. It, that's like for camaraderie. We're a small uh, group. But in Govindaji Gardens, there hasn't in 25 years, it hadn't been Sean walks up and goes, why don't we just go out to Sud Sagar tonight you know? <laughs> and have a good one, you know, or go down to Das Prakash or the, you know, the, whatever, one of these fantastic vegetarian restaurants. They don't, devotees don't, don't like, but they will on various occasions, especially by traveling, you know. Uh, eat in restaurants. And in India, it's pretty simple. The vegetarian restaurants almost anywhere. Uh, in the West, it gets harder and harder. And while traveling, uh, you know, uh, I found out that the vegans are your best bet because they're so militant. You're not going to get a cheese with rennet. You're not going to get a product with egg. You know, they're, they're, they're militant. But vegetarians, especially when it comes to a business, eh, they're not so militant, you know. You'll find things that have eggs in it. So, you know, the first choice is a high end vegetarian rest, Indian vegetarian, high end, like Sud Sagar in these places. And there, there's a list of them. And Anu Lakshmi and Singapore and these places. So. But in the West, it's like, you know, the Hindus have crumbled to the almighty dollar, you know, chicken curries. And, oh, there was a samosa guy there today. Uh, yeah. yeah, chicken samosa. Yeah. Ooh. Samosa mm -hmm. man, right? yeah. No, what no. samosa man They're... was, it was Afghani pack. Oh, yeah. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Afghan and, Afghanistan and Pakistan samosas. Eat. Probably surprised I didn't see some chicken leg hanging out. Of <laughs> <laughs> that as a handle, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so for prashadam, uh, another thing is, 
we don't do that uh, here, and it's a small situation. But at Govindaji Gardens, especially when I'm in there, there's no conversation. People don't sit down in the rows at Govindaji Gardens and start talking to each other. Right? There's no you don't talk. Minimal talk or no talk. You know? I know one Swami, he won't he won't say anything. Even if somebody came in the room with a gun and was ready to shoot somebody, he wouldn't say anything. He never talks while taking Prashad if he's from Kashmir. Kashmiri Brahmin. Never with a Maharaj, do you want some? Do you want some? <laughs> Did you like it? <laughs> Say but that is the thing, not to talk or take him for shot. <clears throat> the stage of our development here in the house situation is different. You know, everybody's out and about. And we come together at Prashada. And there's usually some talk. It's a it's a and in the West, that's where you meet, right? That's where people meet. They're, they meet at the dinner table. And I pointed out, that's where all the fights happen. Mm -hmm. In the West, that's where domestic problems flare up more than any other location. Yeah. You know, maybe trying to get in a single bathroom house, bam, bam, bam <laughs> on the door. But more often, it's at the dinner table. You know? yeah. um, and uh, there, there are little rules. When you're cooking for Krishna, you don't talk. If you do talk, you turn your head. You don't be talking over the thing, because if we turn on the ultraviolet light, you are just bitting into the food. If you turn on the ultraviolet light when you talk, you're spraying. There's, that's why you see these pictures in the Persian Empire. You ever seen these things? The Persian king Darius is on the throne, and there's some servants in front of him like this. That's so, the, and, and, and the commentator says, well, they're so they don't breathe on the king. No, stupid, it's so you don't spit on him. All of a sudden, oh, sorry, sir. <laughs> For your own protection, right? And, 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 and it hasn't happened recently because I haven't been sick, but when I was at a different time sick and Gary comes close to tell me something, he always puts his hand up in front of his face. You look in Bengal, anybody who's coming close to their guru to talk who's in his last days or something around the bed, sick or comes close because his hearing is gone, they always cover their mouth. Throughout Asia, China, everywhere. You just don't want to spit on the emperor. And so you're not supposed to talk when you cook. And, uh, you know, I pointed this out the other day, the devotees are just cooking, but there was some joking going on, and I came out of my room and it's, it's explained, you don't, you don't do this, you have to put you're putting conscious in. If you're frivolous and just joking, well, this it becomes an unacceptable offering. But that time, that wasn't being offered to Krishna. It was going to be offered to me. So it doesn't matter whether you're offering directly to your guru, you're offering it on the altar, you're cooking. It's all about conscious cooking. Weren't you going to call your class or something like that? Yeah. Conscious Ayurveda or something? Very important about the, about the cooking. <clears throat> now, why we don't like to eat in restaurants and things like that? Well, there's several reasons. One is that you accept a like, part of the karma of everybody who's in the restaurant. You go to a restaurant with 50 people in there eating, or 10 people in there eating, you are accepting part of that, of that, of their karma. And then there's the cooks. You have to think about the people who make your food. This mm. is and all the things that are, we do that the, that the world also does, food is the one you have to uh, watch and be careful of the most. Mm -hmm. Someone says, well, what about chips? They're made by a machine. Mm -hmm. It's very different than somebody deep frying some chips, you know, and some guy going, <laughs> hitting a thing and the whole factory goes, burr, 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 burr. bags of chips come out the other end. <laughs> They're cooked by machines. Mm -hmm. And that has been the standard for, for Sankirtan devotees from the very beginning when we started to travel and went away from the ashram. What are we going to do? You know, how much can you cook in a van and all this stuff? And we're all going to be fruitarians. I wasn't going to work. So there were cereals, there were crackers, there were certain things. But the understanding was not perfect, but it was less detrimental. 
because it was cooked by a machine. And ideally, <clears throat> like here, there'll be, you can have some chips, you'll have some this, you'll have some that. We start an ashram, those things disappear. How many bags of chips did you see in the kitchen in the Energy Gardens? The answer is none. There's never been any, and there never will be. We make them. We make potato chips. We make uh, tortilla chips. Even. We make our own food. But at this stage, and eh, we're not quite there yet, and so as long as we're pushing forward, this is doable, it's adjustable. But for an all-time habit, it don't work. You go to any household in the Hare Krishna movement, and there's store-bought cookies. I remember Goswami's house, there was Oreos, St. Newton's, little Cheez-Its, all this junk food for the whole life of the kids as you guys were growing up. Canned sodas, all this stuff. You cannot, and then expect that the children are going to be Krishna conscious. And it's going to work. So Krishna consciousness just isn't something that can go, woo, it just goes out to the world, la di da, there it is. The other day I gave some uh, fruit from our, our, our uh, food shelf harvest. <laughs> I gave a bag of oranges and some apples, and I, I said, uh, I told Goswami, uh, not Goswami, I told Jirga I said, take these and give them to your fellow workers, you know. And I wasn't getting like, well, we got too many, can share it with them. I told him, they'll benefit. Food received from a, a, a devotee in general, and particularly a Brahmin and a sannyasi, is as good as prasadam. But that will also depend on the consciousness of the devotee. So I said, they'll get some benefit. So hopefully when he, he gave it to them, there's some consciousness in doing so, he, he knows oh, they're, they're going to get some spiritual benefit from this. There's a story about the prasad. I don't know how true it is. It's supposed to be a Puranic story. <clears throat> there was a Brahmin. He took Maha prasad. Then he was going through the forest and he was attacked by a, a, a she-wolf and, and killed and, and he was eaten. And then the she-wolf went on and got eaten by a bear. And the bear went on and got eaten by a tiger. And then the tiger got stepped on by an elephant. The elephants are vegetarians, right? So the Brahmin, the wolf, the bear, and the tiger went back to Godhead because they had prashadu. <laughs> and then when they were killed, uh, but the, uh, but the elephant didn't because he he didn't. <laughs> I never heard that. Before. You never heard that? No. <laughs> Probably not true. It's in there. Not a simha parada. <laughs> but the gist of the story was true. Prashadam. Mm -hmm. And there are there are stories about prashadam. How prashadam is dealt with, disrespectfully creating an offense, causing some fall down how prashadam is honored and there, there are there are prashadam stories uh, definitely on the front. but once but someone takes the prashadam maybe even uh, uh, say uh, maha prashadam but usually we don't get people in India give them prashadam say in Puri they jump out of their shoes right in the street and take the prashadam they will not eat prashadam with their shoes on when you take juggling of prashadam to a house in Puri Everybody sits on the floor to honor it. When they take their regular food that their mother cooks for them, they sit at a table in many places. You know, they may sit on the floor. But in modern Puri, they'll sit at a table, or like a kitchen table. But when prashadam uh, comes in, they will stand and honor prashadam. Or if it's like they've got pots of juggling prashadam that you can get, you know, mm -hmm. they sit on the floor. Or well, they squat sometimes, doesn't they? They, they stand and they'll squat and they'll take like this. Yeah. yeah. Respecting and honoring. Prashadam. So, and different sampradayas have different, different ways of, of doing that, you know, with the Shri's there's this mantra and then they mm -hmm. put a little part aside for the, for the other living entities. They never eat everything on their plate. They put something aside yeah. that would be thrown out that some other living beings, insects, worms, or whatever will also get the prashadam. The main thing there is some conscious effort, some awareness. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to what you're doing, type of thing your mother used to say, you know. No, you can't you know, space out when you drive, right? You can't do that. You have to pay attention. 
So the, you know, these types of things can, can be applied for prashadam and also chanting, things like this, paying attention, being conscious of what you're doing. Pictures, for example. You can lay the Bhagavad Gita on top of any pile of newspapers, on any Collier's Magazine, Reader's Digest. Uh, you can even slap it on top of a Playboy magazine. But you never lay anything on top of the Bhagavad Gita unless it's a, uh, a trumpet with a Bhagavatam or a Chaitanya Chaitanya Rita Upanishad. You don't pile a mundane magazine. Right? It's not like there's a special hell for people that have done that, but that's unconscious dealing. You're, you're in the world, you're doing things, you're moving things, and you're not conscious of the difference between these two things. One uh, uh, it contains knowledge of the absolute truth, and the other is simply prajapa or worse. But like I say, if somebody does like that, there isn't some like punishment or it's not some offense, right? But another example, not being aware of what in Krishna consciousness is that story we told a hundred times when uh, Jagadishwar and uh, Goswami were down in southern Vermont near Brattleboro at the house of some devotees from Hawaii who had been devotees for over 20 years, and even been in the personal service of their guru, that's Tulsi Gabbard's group, and uh, they go into their bathroom, they use the bathroom and pass water, and there's a picture of Radha and Krishna hanging directly above the toilet bowl. <laughs> so, you know, Jagadish were like, gets a towel, puts it, <laughs> puts it over the picture, does his business, you know. And another and, and, and I, go, uh, I think Goswami went in there and just took it off the wall and turned it around and put, laid it somewhere. And told, even went so far as to tell it was there. I say, oh, you know, actually, you know, you know pictures of Krishna in the, in the WC here, you know, in the water closet. You know. They went back a few weeks later, the other picture was back on the wall. So not paying attention very much attentive, attentive, it's not, not, uh, and there isn't just a rule book for this. Another example, Prabhupada was uh, riding on an airplane, pushed to, I heard this from Pushed to Krishna, Pushed to Krishna was sitting, um, and the seat, there was an empty seat in between them, and Pushed to Krishna takes and puts down the tray between the two seats, and takes out a picture of Krishna, it might have been from a, one of the books, and puts it there, right? Prabhupada takes the picture and puts it in the seat facing forward. <laughs> <laughs> I forget now what he said. He said, Krishna is not here for us to enjoy something like that. Mm. You know, so it's just like Krishna had, the, had the, occupied the seat when, 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 uh, when uh, push to Krishna, I mean, or the devotee is looking at a picture of Krishna, there's one level of seeing Krishna. But Prabhupada is looking at the same picture, and at such a deeper level, Krishna is there, so why should he be sitting looking at us? Put him in the chair. Mm -hmm. Let people speed back. How would you like to be hanging out on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the tray table? <laughs> <laughs> Let people over shots beat back with Jadima. Oh, yeah. Oh, was it the bead bag or somebody came in with a t-shirt? Uh, Pimble's bead bag. Yeah. yeah. Had a picture of Jagannath and he comes in because the Russians, when they entered the Hare Krishna movement, they weren't always there, you know. They entered in force in, in, the, <laughs> mid, in the 90s and they've all but taken over Vrindavan, including hookers from from Russia, uh, brought in by the, uh, the Russian Goa Mafia. And that's what happens when you just go for the money, go for big, go for this, all this, just everything pours in. Anyway, they took over, and they were, and, and, and it, it, with all sincerity, they were very good with certain crafts, and one of them was this embroidery. And they would embroider absolutely beautiful pictures of Krishna, or even Srila Prabhupada, uh, and on bead bags, and t-shirts, hand embroidered, just absolutely beautiful. And uh, so one devotee, a friend of ours, uh, he's passed away now, uh, he came into a, a room, he's living in Iskand, 
he comes into the room uh, where Shula Puri marches. He's got this beautiful bead bag thing with a nice juggernaut on it, right? Tell the rest of the story. And then when he walked in, when Shula Puri marched, saw that bead bag, and Shula Puri marched, he was he was sitting in his bed. He was like, he he's lying in the bed with his feet straight out, with some pillows behind him. But when he saw that, he went like this. And he, he kept looking up and kept going like this. And Bim was <laughs> looking around. Like, he, 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 he's he, offering he, some yeah, prayers. Three or four times he was offering prayers to Jagannath, and he couldn't understand. And then one sannyasi next to Bimal said, "No, no, it's not to you. It's to the picture of Jagannath and your bead bag." So he's wearing it because it's cool, man. See my Jagannath bead bag. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Purimara is seeing Jagannath, Jagannath, the Lord of the Universe. A very different seeing capacity going on here. What did Bimal do with that bead bag? Well, you told him after I you told him. I think I told him story, he should frame it. Should cut put it out. You said, yeah, put frame it on it. your altar. Yeah. We don't. Allow, we don't. People have showed up at. You know, if they're just there for the day and they come and they go, but if someone's going to stay with us, we've had people come and I let them stay at Guvinaji Gardens and they pop out with their nice Krishna T-shirt and everything. We we tell them just you can put that away. Our devotees have joined us and in their wardrobe of uh, devotional attire they had their juggernaut t-shirts especially the guys and stuff like that and we, we don't allow that the reason we don't allow that is where does that t-shirt go next <laughs> it goes in a funky wash with your socks or your underwear and then it's hung out to dry baking in the sun while you're in a nice air-conditioned room you know and then maybe it even goes under the steam iron, so you can wear your real cool Jagannath shirt. And this Khan temples are full of stores that just sell all this. Everything from keychains to and where that went ultimately on Amazon? We told you about that. Gourney tie on women's underwear. Gourney tie on floor mats that go around the toilet. Uh, bath mats come out of the shower. Shoes. <laughs> Tennis shoes with, with, you know, of course they did everybody else. They did Gordon Thai, they did Mahatma Gandhi, they did Shiva, they did Lakshmi, they did this whole, this whole thing. Where did it start? Where did it really start? They made some t-shirts with Prabhupada's picture on them in around 1970, maybe it was 75. Yeah, because Gore Pony, it was around 75, 76. And who did it? The Aussies. They did it. Prabhupada didn't say, print pictures of t-shirts, my picture of a t-shirt, you know. And then they made a button with Bhakti Siddhanta. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada wore it on his jean bag. And, carried that. and then, psh, then the button culture took over, the t-shirt culture took over. And where did it end up after 30 or 40 years? It ended up on the bathroom floor. It should remember me. Prabhupada once drank a 7-Up, after that, after every feast, a case of 7-Ups would come in, two cases. <laughs> it became known as the green nectar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Every Sunday feast, then, you know, you'd see a band going out that you didn't even go out before the feast. And then they'd come in with a case, depending on how many devotees, case or two of the green nectar. But <laughs> give a little relief to that overeaten feast from one soda to across the board the green nectar even got a special <laughs> look at that poisonous stuff you know you know sometimes you after eating you feel like oh, i need some help <laughs> something to burp or something you know but that's an exception it became like a standard it's like a, a condiment after after a feast, you know, <laughs> the green, green nectar. <laughs> so there are things that you can do to avoid going in the wrong direction, and there are applications that you can do in the right thing, but there's no handbook for them. The main thing is consciousness, and whatever it is that we're doing, applied consciousness. 
that's the theme for your business, isn't it? It's like, we're not mindless guys that just can't do anything, dummy. You know, we, we have college education, we're conscious, educated, smart people, and uh, we can do this job better than anybody else because we do it consciously. I mean, people are cooking, young moms are cooking for their kids and they're playing YouTube or, you, not YouTube, U2 or some heavy death metal and everything and they're cooking and then they're giving it to the kids and they wonder why the kids have problems. <laughs> why? When Jyoti was born, there's a nursery where they take the baby and the way them every three or four hours, right? You do whatever. First time I go with the baby in the nursery, all the nurses are there and they got a cell phone blasting like the worst god awful pop music for all these little babies. And like it just hit me, it's like, oh, this is uh, Jyoti's first pop music, you know? Because we had our single prayers on during her birth in the, in the, in the room as, you know, she, she made her way out. But then her next music was, I don't know what it was. Yeah. Where was mine? Hey, Welcome there, to, I don't know what it was. To the rest of the that's room. what all the babies in the whole nursery were listening to. It was just like, oh. <laughs> like it, was, it was just a weird. And they train they've of proven that if you play uh, more yeah. classical music and uh, things that you know no young person would dare listen to uh, in uh, in what do you call it in dairy farms, uh, milk production rises. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. And you can play that heavy stuff, and cows would just like go go retentive on you, you know. <laughs> they hold it in. Don't give it up. <laughs> Puts them, makes them up yep. tight. Makes them up tight. Mm. Of course, we have some cows. I don't think anything would help. Maybe that's it. <laughs> I tried it. I tried it. I tried singing to a cow to see when I go. Oh, out. you tried singing that song. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Until we get to two liters of nimbu pani. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, a lot in this, you know, a, a lot of young people struggle with an artist. Um, I don't see that we have a big problem here with uh, individual an artist and. That's because I think we give an opportunity that Krishna consciousness develops naturally. There's not a big pressure on, it. and you know, I, I I look at certain people like that. I think it applies to everybody. But two examples I can give right now: one is Druka, the other is Gordon Antaraj. There was never any pressure applied to you, right? It was just this is what we do. These are the things. So it develops naturally. The same with Gordon Antaraj. He came from the village. He didn't even speak English at the time. Um, he, learned, he spoke enough English, but there was no pressure on him. It, it's, uh, so to over-pressure something, it's like the story trying to get your thumb out of a bowling ball. Just relax. Take it easy. Got it. You can over-endeavor to do something which actually complicates or hinders what you're trying to do. You can just... If you practice music before, probably there's been a stage when you just, uh, you're at a practice or something, you just go, okay, that's it. I'm not doing this this thing anymore today because I just can't get it. You just got to let it go, relax, come back to it another day and start fresh, right? There's there's things like that where over-endeavor, even for the right thing, can, can become, uh, you know, it, it can become an obstacle to achieving what you're actually after. I mean, how is it that everybody can wake up at the same time, everybody can eat the same amount of food, everybody can do everything exactly the same, including dress? That's not natural. That is not natural. Bro. <laughs> and in the Hare Krishna movement, everybody woke up at the same time, everybody ate the same thing. They even tried to eat the same amount, because Prabhupada wrote a letter once. You know, nine chickpeas. nine chickpeas, two chapat, whatever. You know, right, Jagat? <laughs> I mean, he'd just be laying there like dead man, you know. And so would Kalki and Vasu and so many others. Gore. Yeah. You know. Yes, you know, I'm not the only target. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. I was getting picked on. Sasquatch. <laughs> I've had my fair share before you. <laughs> so, um, but in a big institution for what, like when you go in the army, everybody dresses the same, everybody gets up at the same time. It's just part of uh, boot camp. But their whole thing is still boot camp. It never goes beyond boot camp. Um, even somebody's dying, they, they, there's not, they got to get out of the temple or they will die. You know, my friend Guru Prashad Swami has cancer that doesn't want to go away, melanoma cancer on his head. You know, he just said, well, I, I'm a, he has a house that his mother gave him in South Texas. And he, he tells me yesterday morning, he says, I, I'm, he's in Panama now. He says, I'm going back to my, you know, uh, little retreat there that he usually spends a few weeks a year, just stays there. And he said, I'm going I'm to stay there and hammer this, this cancer. You, know? you can't do that in a temple. You can't do that there. It's just boot camp. And as soon as you can't keep up with the race, I gave this example once I said, you know what it's like? It's like when you run with the jackals. As long as you're healthy, you can run with the pack, you're okay. But as soon as one jackal falls lame, the others, ah, they just turn on them. As soon as there's a problem, they just turn on you. And problem, I didn't say what the problem would be. This devotee got so irate. You can't compare devotees to jackals. That's a dumper rod. You know, this is a, okay, okay, wait, whatever, whatever. Adios, adios, right? I see him a few days later, and he's got a bandage on his head. And he's got his bags. And he's coming towards my ashram, and I meet him, and I'm headed to the train station to go to South India. And he goes, oh, Mars, I wonder if I can stay at your ashram. And I said, uh, well, what happened? He goes, oh, there was some discrepancy, actually. He was working in the Goshal, and there was some discrepancy, and it was a discrepancy. It was something probably he shouldn't have done. and. So he went lame with the pack, and they turned on him, gave him a beating, stole a bunch of his stuff, and threw his bags in the street. And I said, well, I'm leaving for South India, and there's just two devotees there, and they're not really, there's, that was Keshi Dhamma. Mm. <clears throat> and so I'm just realizing, you know, he's, he's telling me, oh, you can't compare devotees to jackals, but then he got the jackal treatment. Just two days later, there was some discrepancy in something he'd done. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and the result was he got a physical beating and got some of his stuff stolen and got thrown out in the street. Exactly what I said they were like. They're like running with a pack of jackals. So long as you're healthy and running with a pack, you're all right. And as soon as something goes wrong, they turn on you and eat you alive. And there's a saying in ISKCON, we never lost a good man. Mm. Oh, a good woman. It doesn't matter who, what. As soon as you leave that pack, yeah, dude. You know, you're painted black. Mm -hmm. So this is just something ha that happens with big institutions. Now somebody has written a book. It's called Divine or Demoniac, mm. or Divine yeah. and Demo Yes, yeah, Divine yeah. and Demoniac. And he tells a lot of the history of the Christian movement and what went on with Rome and a lot of stuff that you hear me sometimes mention in casual talk or sometimes in a class. And then he's laying the overlay parallel what happened in this guy. Big institution, the corruption that enters, the standard, how, you know, the rigidity of many things just to keep the shape, but yet within so much about hypocrisy, contradiction, corruption, deviation, and the loss of transcendental truth. Now the book is offered for 99 cents, but I wouldn't even waste 99 cents on it. Why do I want to read what I already know? There's no sense in wasting 99 cents. I, I, know I could get a bag of smart popcorn for 99 cents. <laughs> that would be a better deal. <laughs> or even a can of green nectar. <laughs> if I catch anybody with that book, then I'm gonna turn on you. <laughs> Uh, there's there's books where devotees they see the problem no solution just bitter and the same devotee sees all the problems and he was talking to Gary he even knew the history of Christianity he came to Gwinnergy Gardens once I wasn't there <laughs> and it, and he's explaining the whole thing about you know how what where, where Christianity Judaism and 
Zoroastrianism. He 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 done his homework. He knew the whole thing, and then he came to the intergalactic lizards that are ruling planet Earth. You know, it's like <laughs> and I'm coming to this guy. Yeah, and it's like if an intergalactic anything came here, I think the least of their interest would be the Hare Krishna. Really <laughs> <laughs> Some big. Oh, or they used to say, you know, the aliens mm. come and hover over Mayapur in spaceships to observe the progress of this <laughs> And when I heard that, I was at the Ganges River, and somebody said that out loud, and I popped up and said, I said, well, whoever the hell said that came out of a spaceship. And one devotee, Ramdas, pulls me, pulls at my arm, pulls me down, he says, all right, Keish is one that said that, and those are his Russian disciples right over there, so keep it. <laughs> They're aliens, you know. I mean, and I told him, I said, if some aliens came, okay, in their spaceships, they wouldn't have any interest in this kind of building a couple buildings made out of cement and steel. If anything, they'd be hovering over Srila Puri Maharaj's ashram, marveling over a human being who has achieved the ultimate goal of life, love of God. That would be worth an alien going along. Look at this species of human. Not those clowns with their pizza shops and their and their gift shops with keychains and their big, big monstrosity temple. <laughs> who thinks the world is flat? <laughs> you know? So that's what well, that's that's called uh over-exaggerated self-importance. Mm -hmm. Understand? Yes. Yep. So the important thing is, the safe thing is follow the leader. We, I, we, we had a good leader. And it's very clear there's those who followed the leader and those who didn't. The important thing is follow your leader. That's the safest path. Yes. But if you don't have a good leader, that's your misfortune. And you have no one to blame but yourself. Because everybody gets what they deserve. Nobody is actually cheated. There's the cheaters and the cheated. But the, the, cheated, the cheated are cheaters. Uh, sorry. The cheaters are cheated because they ultimately don't want to pay the price for reality. That's the way it is. When we would sit with Srila Pori Maharaj, or even Srila Srila Maharaj, I don't think I ever saw more than 10, this many people in the room with Pori Maharaj. This is the most I ever saw. Mm -hmm. On his 100 year anniversary, there was a big festival and people came, that was thousands of people and everything, but you know, that's 10,000 people come to John Mastami also. Mm -hmm. You know, in but more than half of them don't even know who I am. They don't know who's who, what's what. Mm -hmm. They're coming for the Peshaw, they're coming for the festival, it's John Mastami, whatever. Those, those you, don't, you don't measure, you don't count. Not more than 10 or 15 people. I did see once on a Gore Point email, there were about 30 devotees, no, 25 devotees on the veranda with Srila, uh, Srila, uh, yes, with, with Srila, Srila Maharaj. Mm -hmm. I have, on the other hand, visited an, an, uh, a Bhagavatam class, you might have been there that year, Gary, in Mayapur, where there was at least 500 devotees in the class. And the class was full of nonsense and blasphemy. Vaishnava Parada. Numbers don't mean anything. Rup Sanatan, how many disciples did they have? One or two. They wrote the books that are found. They didn't have thousands of disciples, hundreds of disciples, even dozens of disciples. I told this GBC the other day when I was talking to him. There was this, uh, there was this other Swami. And somebody sent me thinking, oh, he just initiated 200 people in one day. I said, wow, that's only half of what this other Swami initiated in one day. He initiated 400 people in one day. Um, but what are those 200 people doing? Well, there's 400 people doing. What are those? There's one devotee. He has 20,000. There's a couple of devotees. My God, brothers, they have 20,000 disciples. They've never written a book. They've never even published a book. They've never even written an article. 
What do they ask me now? They're just Kanishta Kanishtas with very poor training. Then the guru writes a book about his life. Now there's a book tearing that book apart. <laughs> House full of lies, and misleading statements. Muhammad becomes a pure devotee. Jesus is a pure devotee. George Harrison, Srila George Harrison. <laughs> Srila George Harrison. I'm surprised he didn't do a samadhi. Did they? No, they didn't. I'm surprised he didn't do a samadhi for him in Vrindavan. You know? I mean, God bless George, but he wrote his biography, and Prabhupada is mentioned in a half a paragraph. And Sripad Baba's got a whole chapter. And Srila George. And, and I told my friend yesterday, I said, you guys are leaving this behind and it's just going to metastasize. You haven't been able to hold it on the path of what it really is. And it's just metastasized into this ugly beast from kirtan to dress to social behavior to swamis running around looks like they're a clown, a liter, liter, literally a clown in a circus. Wearing some bunny rabbit shoes with some dumb looking hat with flowers. Looks like one of these exotic uh, Venice Beach bag, uh, bag people. You know, walking around with a shopping cart. That's what he looks like. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what comes out of his mouth? I can't expect that there'll be much of a difference between the way he's dressed and what comes out of his mouth. And it just so happens. He was in the room when I was talking, and the, and the, and the, uh, the other sannyasi goes, uh, Sanjus Maharaj is here. And then I just cranked it up and told him, there's no way he could come in front of Prabhupada or Bhakti Siddhanta dressed like a monkey. And he was in the room at the other end of the Skype, presumably, because he mm -hmm. said he's here with me. And when I heard that, instead of toning it down, I just cranked it up. <laughs> Along with this sannyas order comes a responsibility to maintain the dignity. It's also your dress. Like the Srila Sridharmars would not come out and talk to the devotees unless he had his uttari on. I didn't put mine on tonight. I thought this would be enough. But there's some, there's some dignity to be maintained. We have a particular dress. But more important, we have a philosophy, we have a behavior. And they're trying to defend those crazy kirtans that you see in the beginning of that as, oh, well, you know, they're in here. No, those are not ecstatic kirtans. There's another group of devotees who agree with us a, a lot. Might as well give them the update on that. Sure. Right? We did the statistics on let's talk analysis. 51 of our 51% of our viewers, I might get a couple of these things wrong, but 51% of our viewers are between the age of 24 and 34. Mm -hmm. That was larger than that. No, that was 51%. Then 47% were between, or whatever it was, 48, 7, or 6%, were right. between uh, 34 and uh, 44. Mm -hmm. In the age group of Prabhupada disciples, it was like one point something percent. Sixty-five plus. Yeah. Yeah, on this. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, it Fifty. It was three percent. Fifty something to yeah. sixty-five plus. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's our age, that's the bulk of the Prabhupada disciple age group. Mm. There was no interest. I, I said at the time, they're they're, you know, with due respect, they're 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 mummified. You know? Yeah. They're not going to change. No. It's the younger people, and a lot of them. When we look at the names, there's Russians in there, there's initiated devotees, you don't know what country they're from. Many Dasas, and they're not our Dasas. They're not 800 people watching our videos from our mission, because we don't even have 80 people. But to speak of 850 viewers, who are these people? Well, there's a lot of Hindus in there, a lot of Indians. Uh, there's people who are not initiated, they've got Russian written names, you know. And you go click on their thing, they got pictures of Krishna or something. You know, they're on the outskirts of the Hare Krishna movement. It's more likely ISKCON because they have more doors to come through than anybody else. And many of them have a spiritual name such as Das. 
that means they're initiated by somebody in ISKCON, yet they're watching our videos. They comprise the bulk of our audience, 24 to 44. Your age, your age, your age. Sorry. <laughs> Younger people. And there was another interesting thing. There was another one, male and female. 90, what was it, 90, 95.5% were men, 4.5% were women. And part of it is because women usually don't like controversy. That rocks the boat. That's, that's a disturbing thing, most. And then the nature of the talks, the kind of philosophy pointing out things of supernatural and this and that. There's just, that was statistics in Google Analytics. 4.5% are women because I guess they, they know that because they know everything about us, right? They know how old you are, they know what music you like, they know what, where you go shopping. As soon as you look for something on Amazon, they bam, 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 bam. You just start starting mixing machines, mixing machines. It's just like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes you mouse and it clicks on something you didn't mean it to. One time I moused over something, you know, and it clicked on some nonsense. So then I just went and started looking at yachts, Rolexes, hunting knives, uh, surfboards. And I just, for about an hour, just kept viewing these things and then boom, that disappeared. So that, if you look at my side thing, that's what it is. It's stand-up paddles, kayaks, uh, big knives, <laughs> a few guns. <laughs> Even you talk about something in front of your phone, I think it picks up. It does. Yeah. It does. You walk by a store, you walk by and stand in New York in front of a Gucci store like that, go down a block, turn on your phone, Gucci advertisements. It picks it up when you walk by and stood in front of a store window, it registers you. So, yeah, so anyway, so that was, that was some of the statistics. What were the countries very much? It was most of the U.S. Countries were the United States, mm. English speaking, England, and India were mm. the three biggest countries. Mexico as well. Uh, then there were, well, Mexico, there was a lot yeah. from Mexico. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, there was Russia. Czech Republic. Well, we know who those people yeah. are. You yeah. know? We know them by name, you know. Yeah. There's a few But the ladies that are watching, that we do know who they are, are very, very good Vaishnavis. Some from the older generation and some from the younger generation. You see? But, but overall, because who are they getting? In, what, look, look at the Hare Krishnas. How are they dealing with the women? They've got you all Kori all dressed up like it was going to be your wedding day and then out there dancing in front of the kirtan all together like this. And it's just like, they're not even leading them towards uh, some intellect, more more of an intellectual, yeah. philosophical, yeah. spiritual understanding of things. It's all about that. It's just yeah. all about being happy. It's called the uh, feel good movement. You know, feel good. You know? And I pointed out to my friend in the conversation. I said, "Look at the world. Putin, strong leader. Forget what he stands for. Strong leader. That guy down in the Philippines. He'll kill you." Oh, do talk to you. For drugs. He got a solution. He sends his boy and they kill you. Out of the picture. Gone. Finished. He's killed several thousands of drug users down there. We're talking about heroin and stuff. Just kill him. Get him the hell out of here. Not good. I'm not saying good or bad, but strong leader. Modi, a strong leader. Trump, a strong leader. Right? Strong leaders are in vogue. You know, you got Paris burning, you've got France burning for the last two months, this yellow vest movement hardly gets any press, but you know, Brexit, Brexit. you got all this stuff, you know, so where are the strong speakers in ISKCON, I said, you got a Swami running around, looks like a clown, and you have to ask him, oh, Prabhu, could you, you know, could you take off the hat, no, I don't want to, okay, give me like, take them. And, and here's the parallel. I, got, I didn't write that letter today because we went out. I went out with the Ruka and Yoga Mind. You can kick somebody out of ISKCON for reading Srila uh, Sridhar Maharaj's books, but you can't reprimand this clown. What the hell does that tell you? You kick people out into the street 
for reading Sridhar Maharaj's books, mm -hmm. but you allow one of your own to walk around in the dress of a sannyasi and act like a clown. Mm -hmm. Well, at least kick him out too. <laughs> <laughs> Once I was his devotee, he, he had been a big collector. I forget his name. Uh, something Krishna was his name. He's <clears throat> a huge collector. And he would stay in Chicago Temple a lot and go out and do his collection from there. I forget how he did it, but it was $500 every day. And he was from originally Gita Nagri, but he traveled and he spent a lot of time basing out of our Chicago Temple at the time. And uh, so years and years later, he comes to Vrindavan. I was out of, I was out of this con. And, he, and, and I meet him in the market and he, he's looking pretty sickly. And he goes, yeah, I'm pretty sick. Feeling pretty bad. I can't get this and that. My money's run thin and everything. And uh, yeah, they, they won't give me a decent room in the in the in the ashram in Krishna Bhavaka. So I wasn't really wanted him to come and stay in my ashram. He was a disciple of Sasarup Maharaj, but I didn't know him. And I said, well. You know, you can come and uh, spend some days in my ashram to you get your health together, you know, but uh, I can also give you a suggestion that might solve your problem. I said, you go back to the temple and you go to the temple authorities and tell them you met me in the market and you're going to join my ashram. <laughs> and I said, chances are, and, and you have to say, if you don't give me a room, I'm just going to join the Shema Maharaj. And there, chances are they're going to give you a room. <laughs> so I didn't see him for about two weeks and I bumped into him again and he goes, it worked. I, I went, what worked? He goes, I told him I was going to join your ashram. They didn't give me a room. They gave me a nice single room in the guest house. This is the way it works. And that's just, let's move on to better topics. I, I get sidetracked. You can, you can see it's a rough edge with me. You know, right, back to our better right. topics. Yoga Maya was asking about the importance of the great and history of the great personality Tulsi Devi. Well, <clears throat> there's a history of Tulsi worship here. I mean, in our in the Hare Krishna movement, it was started by uh, it was started by uh, Govinda Dasi in Hawaii. I don't know how she ended up with Tulsi or how she got to learn about Tulsi, but Srila Prabhupada had never said much about it. But she kind of self-explored that. And uh, you, I think there's probably some things written about it, and, and, and she began the worship of, of Tulsi. Prabhupada didn't say anything about Tulsi. It just, this is an auspicious plant. Tulsi is a devotee of Krishna. He didn't tell any of the history, how Tulsi came into this world, the stories in the Puranas, who is Tulsi in the spiritual world. But at one point, a question was asked, and it was asked in a letter, and it was answered in a letter, and it went everywhere. And the, question was, there are Tulsi in all the temples now. Everybody had Tulsi. You had Tulsi greenhouses. It didn't matter where. There were Tulsis. So the question was, one of the devotees, I forget who asked the Vidya. question. Vidya. He was a Bhaktisthanta's wife. Vidya. Yeah, mother Vidya. Yeah. Um, and she asked Srila Prabhupada, the Tulsi plants, are each one, are they each individual devotees? Are they, are they individual souls? Like, Tulsi's a pure devotee. So, you know, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, and we got a, a farm of 5,000, Tulsi's growing, there's 5,000 pure devotees, they're all separate. Prabhupada wrote back and said, no, Tulsi is one soul. Because trees, animals, bushes, they have soul. Mm -hmm. Not just dogs, insects, things that move, things that don't move. Symptoms of, uh, of, of the presence of the soul are birth, death, in between, growth, Reproduction, there are six symptoms of life. And wherever you can read them, consciousness has to be there. So uh, he said, uh, no, there's only one Tulsi. That Tulsi is in the spiritual world. Well, it so happens that that Tulsi in the spiritual world is not a plant. That Tulsi in the spiritual world is a gopi named Brinda Devi. And Brinda Devi's father owns the forest of Brinda Bond. It means the forest of Brinda Devi. It's not the forest of Radha. It's not the forest of Krishna. Brindavan, Brinda Bond, Bond is forest. And Brinda means 
Brenda Davey. Her father owned that tract of land, which used to be a forest, like here. Somebody owns this forest out here, this mountain out here. Mm -hmm. And then Brenda Davey gave it in charity to Radharani, but it bears her name, Brenda Davey. So there is a pastime, a Leela pastime, uh, where there's some quarreling in the Leela of Krishna. And then Brenda Davey appears in the world as a queen. And, uh, uh, and not just a queen, maybe the most chaste, devoted queen ever in Puranic history or something like that, not just a queen. And her husband is in a conflict with Vishnu. And they're fighting on the battlefield and Vishnu cannot defeat the king. And he understands that the, 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 uh, the king is protected by the purity and the chastity of his wife. What's the queen's name? Oh, I can't remember her name. He was Jal uh, Jalanda. He was an Asura. I can't remember her name. Yeah. Yeah. So this is all Leela. Now, like, how did that happen? What is a karma? Not karma, Leela. Drama. Predestined arrangement. And so Vishnu realizes that if he can corrupt the queen and and that doesn't mean have sex with the queen that just means spend the night with her in the same room that would be enough to corrupt her purity her chastity and then Vishnu would be able to kill the queen uh, kill the king and so he transforms himself into the shape of the king and he returns from the battle mm. And he passes the night in the palace, and the next morning he goes back off to battle. That's what the queen sees. But that's actually Vishnu. Then, in the day's battle, Vishnu kills that, the king. And when this happened, then the queen understood that that was not my husband. That was Vishnu. And he has played this low, treacherous trick and so she curses Vishnu you you have done this because you, your heart is like a stone you're cold hearted like a stone I curse you to become a stone so Vishnu accepts the curse but counter curses the queen to become a river it's the river right now here's where I'm lost in the story. How does she become a plant? But she becomes a river, and that's the Gandaki River. And the stones are the Shali ground. And the whole drama is so that Brinda Devi will be married to Krishna. And there's this function that takes place once a year. It's called the marriage of Shali Gram and Tulsi. And it's performed in temples, and it's a wedding ceremony between the Tulsi plant and the Shaligram. But that Tulsi plant is Brenda Devi, that Shaligram is, is Vishnu Krishna. But it's in a lower Leela, it's a lower Leela. It's a Vaikuntha style Leela. But it originates from a, from a pastime in Goloka. Actually, how she uh, appears as the plant, I, you know, in the story, uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't have that information for you. I'm not an encyclopedia. I'm sorry. <laughs> but Brinda Devi, when you see our Brinda Devi, is the gopi named Brinda. That's who that plant is. It's, she's not the queen. No, it's a direct. And there is no Tulsi plant in the loka. The Tulsi herself is there. Now, this is a thing in Vrindavan. There are certain groups of Sahajis, they won't worship the Tulsi plant because they say there is no Tulsi plant. That's only for here. And we say, yeah, and you're here. So get with the program. You grow the Tulsi, honor the Tulsi, all of this. But they try to assimilate what is there here. And that's called Sahaji, that's imitation. 
After hundreds of years and even thousands of years of Sampradayas and Vaishnavism, there are so there are a lot of strange going on in India. There are pe 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 peculiarities in these Sampradayas. Some of them are all right; they're good. That's their peculiarity, you could say. And in some cases, they are like, who made that up? Like the stories of Tirupati, that Vishnu's in debt, right? Vishnu's in debt. He has a great debt to Kavera for his wedding. He had to go in debt to Kavera. It's like the supreme opulent being had to go in debt. Oh, there could be some pastime, but let's continue. Yeah, he's in debt, and he has to repay that debt. And so if you will donate to Balaji and Tirupati, right, that will help him pay his debt to Kubera, and he'll reward you back double what you give to him. It's like, this is where people lose their intelligence. <laughs> then how in the heck does he ever get out of debt? Right? I'm in debt, I need $100, but if you pay me this $100, I'll pay you $200 back. I'm in debt, Where do I, and I give the $100 over here, how do I get the $200 to pay you? So I have to borrow $200 to pay, how do I get out of debt? You don't get out of debt, but the temple gets rich. And that story is printed in every little book that is sold in bookstores in Tirupati. It's in magazine, the to Kata. It's everywhere. And when they told this story to Sridhar Maharaj, he just laughed and said, a novel invention. <laughs> the Supreme Lord is in debt. And you're gonna you're gonna bail him out with your donations and he's gonna pay you back double. Very sweet. And we see us kind of doing similar things now. Though. You know, oh, you want your son to pass examination? Oh, you have this financial problems? Just send us your name. We'll do an RT. You know, what the understanding is when the cash comes home, you'll come and give some to us. It's this is Hindus. Mrs. Jerry says, "Oh, just like Guru Maharaj, please bless Piyush that he will pass his exams." I say, "You're asking me, <laughs> barely a high school graduate." <laughs> My blessings wouldn't help at all. I said, but the fact is, if he's stupid, he's going to fail. If he studies hard and he's smart, he's going to pass. And they're like, mm. <laughs> It's like, you know, God for a Hindu is a free free pass, free ticket. You know, give a blessing and you'll pass. Blessings that one Hindu came to Prabhupada and said, Oh, Swamiji, give my blessing. Prabhupada said, Do you want my blessing? Oh, yes, Swamiji, you want your blessing. He pointed at Brahmananda. He's a sannyasi, freshly shaped up. He goes, this is my blessing. This is the result of my blessings. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said to the man, so you want my blessings? You want sannyas? And the man, <laughs> the story's kind of faded, but the man was, uh, 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 no, not really. Well, yes, but no. <laughs> <laughs> because as the song goes, give me health, give me wealth, and a home by the sea. Jai That's the Hindu Arti song. But Prabhupada was merciless with Indians. Merciless. And one day one Indian professor, who was the professor that Rabindra Saru was studying under for some degree or something, they brought him to see Prabhupada. This Hindu was such a Hindu, Prabhupada said, throw him out of here. Get him out of here. And the man didn't want to leave. So they just grabbed this professor by the back of the coat and drug him out of Prabhupada's room. Nonsense. But then he'd meet some Christian priest or somebody from the West and he'd be a lot, lot, lot more tolerant with them. But even then sometimes he took them to the rug. Why are you eating meat? Thou shalt not kill. And, uh, Thou shalt not kill. He would just nail them. We want to talk about, and one man said, can't we talk about some higher principle? And Prabhupada said, there is no higher principle if you are killing and eating meat. You cannot go farther. But mostly he was tolerant. When he stayed in the house of, uh, uh, I forget their name, Agarwals in Butler, Pennsylvania, he came a little bit early to the house one day and she'd been cooking meat and the house had this, small house had the smell of meat. Oh, so she said, oh, Swami, I'm sorry. I said, no, no, it's okay. it's okay. He was very tolerant. You know. But with his own kind, zip. Zero tolerance. But with his own countrymen, he said, the big pig swims the river to eat the stool on the other side, and the little pig stays at home. 
He was talking about Hindus who come to the West to increase their 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 material fortune. But those same Hindus have become the saving grace of the Hare Krishnas in the United States. Mm -hmm. I mentioned this to yeah. this GVC. Without them, we wouldn't have a single temple in this country. They would all have failed. Chicago, Hindus, LA, Hindus, San Diego, Hindus, mm -hmm. Atlanta, Hindus, Tawako. New York, Hindus, Tawako, Hindus. You just go around the horn, it's Hindu, 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 Hindu. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the money is collected by go devotees going out and telling lies. Selling hats at football games, baseball games, telling lies. Not by honest businesses. By telling lies. And then you're trying to cultivate a group of people whose first quality is, uh, what is it, socha, truthfulness, purity. Oh, satyam. Satyam, truthfulness. But everybody makes a living by telling lies. We don't do that. We don't do that. It's better to build character, simple movement, maintain purity. It doesn't matter how many we are, more or less. More would be nice, but be careful. More is not the goal. Nice is the goal. And you have some, I mean, I say this, I don't want you to think like this, but I'll tell some of my others. So this guy, this guy has 10,000 disciples. What book have they published? What articles have they written? What films are they making? The answer is nada. And when they made one, it shows a light coming out of Prabhupada's head as if he was some kind of Merlin the Magician. And what have you done with thousands of disciples? If you had 20, if I had 20,000 disciples who were like all of you, we would take over this country. <laughs> we take over something. <laughs> like he did, just yeah, get Bernie Ken up here to run for governor. <laughs> Maybe we can get rid of Bernie Sanders. And, you know. <laughs> you have, yeah. Prabhupada thought B. And if you said, Prabhupada, in future, I will have 20,000 disciples by your grace, he'd then, he'd then give you some target to take over. And it wouldn't just be, you know, compromising for everything from snake puja to hair cutting ceremonies and just to get money from Hindus. Like that. He, would, he, he, he thought big. It was, it's, it's sometimes hard to accept that. I can't think like that. We're going to take over anything. We're just trying to take over a little piece of property <laughs> where we can live purely and cultivate Krishna consciousness in the extreme. All right, what was uh, next? Or it's getting late. It's, uh, what time is it? It's uh, 8.23. So let me see if I can quickly answer the rest. Sure. Quickly. Okay. We could get a pad for this chair. These these oh, prison bars are digging into my back. You know? yes. Not now, I mean for future. It's a thinner one. That's too thick now. It's actually quite thin, Gorman. It's very yeah, it's soft. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Her back weight. <laughs> <laughs> Bet your ears they're mine. <laughs> Too younger. <laughs> You'll recover faster. <laughs> Kelki's question was in uh, Lord Chaitanya and Five Features. Prabhupada explains that it is wrong to think that Jai Vijay, the Lord's associates, come down every millennium to act as demons. He says that when Shishupal merges into the body of the Lord, he was not Jaya or Vijaya, but was actually a demon. Could you please explain what this means? No, I can't explain what that means. It means Sister Paul was actually a demon, and uh, Jai and Vijay are eternally gatekeepers in Vaikuntha. That's all I. That's all I know about. Usually, all these Puranic story mm -hmm. uh, things are mentioned there and there are somewhere else in their entirety. Mm -hmm. And the uh, story of Prahlad, how how is it that he's born in the family of a demon? It's there in some other Puranas, more extensive. So about that, I'd have to, we'd have to do some reading and research and, and uh, about that. We had another question. In Sri Guru and His Grace, Sri Sridhar explains the relationship between God brothers and God brother gurus. Where? In Sri Guru and His Grace. Yeah. Um, he explains that sometimes God brothers will disagree or chastise one another, but will show formal respect when around the disciples. 
Can you please explain the proper vision and attitude of a disciple when he witnesses such dealings between his guru and god brothers? Which? Which dealings? Argumentative, quarreling dealings? Yes, any, it's any. none of your business. <laughs> You're simply an observer and not to be the judge. And this is where Iskand Prabhupada's disciples, many of us, made the mistake of trying to be the judge of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I pointed out, you know, it's just, it's just a one-sided thing. It's like guilty, guilty, to the point that they don't understand. <clears> oh, <throat> Prabhupada said, and they'll quote something he said about his god brothers, right? But if somebody says something against Prabhupada, whoa, whoa, big upper on, big upper on. It's like, you don't think they love their guru? You don't think these other disciples, Sridhar Maharaj, God Brothers, Yajabhar Maharaj, all, all these men, you don't think their disciples had any love for their guru, Guru Maharaj, any of them? Only we? And they had no love for Bhakti Siddhanta? Only Prabhupada? It's a, Bhakti Siddhanta, Prabhupada, and us. Nobody else matters. That means they're way out of their league. Way out of their league. They have no business in those discussions, in those judgments. And therefore, uh, usually these things aren't to be like whatever you've heard me tell you about my dealings with certain devotees and, and this and that, and even those that, it's just a fraction. And like in our mission, I used to say, and I still say it leave all the fighting to me. You're not to be writing, art. you know, you get some disciple, somebody writing an article about Tamal Krishnamars or Radhanath or something like that. It's like, shut that guy up. What? But that's how disturbed they are. Even second generation devotees are attacking in many places. Not as many, but they are there. They're, they're disturbed, they're angry, they're frustrated, and they don't have any guidance, and their guru can't. Put them in the right place. What's, what's their business? So the real nitty-gritty things I'd never share with you. Because they just they're, they're, they just be a disturbance. You, know? you have no influence in that zone. It's just like, so what? You know? There always has to be somebody, though, that is a little more tuned in to what the, what the guru is doing. And that's usually someone like Geary, who's very close to me, who's a sannyasi who will be expected in the future to also lead and he has to know about what really happened. Yeah. Like the, the story of the telegram, he keeps saying that should be told, nobody's going to tell that story, you should tell that story on Let's Talk and everything, but I haven't told it yet and I may never will. But I have decided to tell all the, what do you call them, the stories, the, Experience. my experiences and things that I saw, mostly favorable, Wish for the Prabhupada on film, but that's just for you. That's not for, you know, like uh, Siddhanta wants to come and interview me. You know Siddhanta. He wants to come and interview me so he can slap me on a, a DVD and, and get it out there for the world. And it's just like, I'm not for the world. I'm for you. I'm not for, I don't give a damn. I'm not for them. I'm for you. And so I will share my experiences uh, with Srila Prabhupada and then there's some benefit in that. But I'm just, I just can't, you know. And some of them are not pleasant stories. This is what happened. This is the way things were. Um, and, uh, but I see no benefit in, in sharing really, I'm not inclined to share any of it with them. Have it be on a, become part of the memory uh, a portfolio of videos that you can buy for thirty-five dollars or a hundred bucks. Yeah, or something. Yeah. Huh? you said they can see us in second class to Yeah, like there's a Vyasa, there's a Vyasa Puja book okay. for Prabhupada for his, his disciples who are not officially in this car. It's just like I don't. What makes you think Prabhupada reads that book? <laughs> and why would I want to write for it anyway? For those disciples who are back. I want to write. I told them not that she was invited this year to write. They invited me every year for about 10 years and then they just gave up. <laughs> Especially when I met the person that's Gordas who does it. It's just like, what an insult. Iskan has their Vyasa Puja book they offer every year to Prabhupada. And then for you second class citizens who don't really rate 
you know what we're going to do? We're going to let you write authors, and we're going to publish them in that book. So don't you feel good? And you get a free book. You get a free book. And I told him, who reads that? Who reads You read your own offering? What, you think somebody else cares what you have to say? Anybody this kind cares? You can write your own offering to Prophet anytime you want, anytime to your guru, anytime you want. You don't need somebody to publish it and, and brand it second-class citizens' offerings. You know? <laughs> and they think, they think that they're actually doing you a service. So you have no access. They're talking about Prabhupada disciples, not, not you. They're talking about Prabhupada, they're like Mata. You have no access to Prabhupada. Well, you can write and we'll publish and uh, you know, we'll send it up to Vaikuntha. <laughs> and I was telling what makes you think Prabhupada even reads the main one? What do you think, he's up there waiting for you to print that book? Don't shoot it up there or something, you know? I mean, when those things are done, we offer those things. They offer them on the Vyasa Sun or something like that. We print a book, we offer it to the deities. That, that's just ritualistic. You don't have to offer it there. Krishna sees it. You don't have to put it up in his face. He sees it. But if you have deities and of, of the guru or things like that, then you, you may do that that day. But if they take it so far as to, like, you know, Prabhupada doesn't, see you, it doesn't know you there, but if we print your offering, then maybe, maybe, in his spare time he might. Okay, he'll, huh? he'll see you at the back of the bus. <laughs> the back of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work like that. <laughs> That's institutionalism. Institutionalism. I mean, I, um, asked Mother Lee, so somebody came to visit us once in West Paulette. I forget who they were exactly, but uh, I actually don't know who they were. But they asked uh, the, the, the guy, the husband, he asked Leela Smarna, uh, how long have you been in, in, in Maharaj's mission? And she said, seven years. So that's a long time ago. And he said, what's the name of it? And she goes, I don't know. <laughs> He's like, you don't know? You're in something for seven years and you don't know what the name is? She goes, no, I have to ask my husband. And when the story was told me, I was like, yeah, so what, what are we called anyway? What, what, have you ever heard me talk about what our mission is called, the name? No. Nope. Nope. We have this thing called Nature's Guardian. That's just for taxes. Yeah. <laughs> you know. We have an ashram called Govindaji Gardens, or Sri uh, Tanya Trust. Trust. Yeah. There is a trust. I don't even know. I'm not even on it. It's again, that's because of government. That's because of laws in the modern world. You have to be somebody. In Mexico, we are getting the papers next week. We are officially <coughs> Comunidad Krishna Yoga. <laughs> Krishna Yoga community in English. So when we're on TV, it's like, who are you guys? Uh, no, you have to, in this world you have to have a name, you have to be somebody, you have to have a bank account, otherwise you're nobody. And then this kind of always brings them, the people. Have you ever heard this word? Have you ever, have you ever heard me say, where do I put on my karmi dress? <coughs> put on your karmi dress? And now that guy that was fixing your bed and that guy's a karmi? You've never heard me say that. That's standard everyday vocabulary in this one. There's us them. We're the saints, they're the demons. They're the karmis, fruit of workers, you know. And there's more fruit of workers in these temples than there is on the outside. Yeah. I mean, it's just un they, be karmis. they become karmis. The thing that they're always pointing at points back at them. They're saying you point the finger at one, but three fingers point back. Actually, the karmis is a, uh, is a compliment. Yeah. A v yeah, right. they, v yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but we don't talk, you know, we don't call, call people karmis. Yeah. There are people, we understand, oh, man, that person's got problems. But, gee, wow. Or that person's, we understand that person's got a bad vibe. That person's demoniac. But we're not just blanketing every person out there as a karma. You know, and thus, separating ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are so superior. We don't think that we're superior. Although... What we know in this room, and what I know in this chair, 
There's nobody else in this whole state that knows those things. Some of these kind of believe in reincarnation, you know, this and that, they have no knowledge at all. And in some places, I've been in places where I was the only person on a continent. There was nobody else who knew what I knew. But do I come off as being proud? Mm -hmm. well, there's, no, there's nobody in the state, there's nobody in the university that knows what I know. I mean, I don't know what they know either, but what they know is just material knowledge. It's not transcendent. It's, it, it's just mundane. It will vanish at the end of this life. Vanish. The transcendental knowledge will go with us to the next life, what we know. But you shouldn't allow that because <clears throat> it says hum uh, what is it? there's a saying something to the effect of knowledge without humility is and what it is is I forget what it is, but it's a negative. It's not real knowledge. Unless it's accompanied by humility. That doesn't mean to hang your head and be abused. That's not humility. But humility first starts with not thinking that you're better than if you know you are. <laughs> In other words, we don't say, well, yeah, they know, I know, let's hear their opinion. I want to hear their opinion. I've already come across the ocean of knowledge. I'd like to invite them to that ocean of knowledge, wisdom. The things that we're looking at Brian Forrester and others, not transcendent. And whether it was a Nagas or some aliens, whoever, that's irrelevant. That's not transcendental knowledge. The Mahabharata is not transcendental literature. It is a material literature. Ramayana is a material literature. It means that there isn't a place where Ramayana is being reenacted in Vaikuntha, the spiritual world. It's not being reenacted there. Ram's not in exile, all this thing. But Krishna, the things he performed here, except for the killing of the demons, his higher pastimes, are being performed there eternally. His, as it is said, love dalliances with his devotees goes on eternally. But Mahabharata is called, the, we called it the road show. It just goes universe after universe after universe after universe. It only happens here. It doesn't happen in the spiritual world. So in that way, we say it's mundane. And Ramayana also. But within these stories, wow, incredible. They're there for the benefit of the common people. Bhagavatam is not for the common people. Chaitanya Charitamrita is not for the common people. But as common a literature as we have that you can give to people, is the Bhagavad Gita and the Isha Upanishad. Our, all other literatures are exclusively for devotees. They're not for the public. I told you the story they're passing out, whichever canto it is with Varaha. Third huh? Third. And there's a picture of Varaha on the cover. Could you grab could you find that real quick? Quick quick. It's the one with Varaha. I think it's the back it's on the back cover or the front cover. Of which which canto I can't third, I think. Third. On the back. Part three, part two, no. No, you made a trifle. Nope. So anyway, I'll just tell the story. I think you've heard me say it before. There's a devotee passing out Bhagavatam's in an airport. And he's passing out the canto and it's uh, printed Braha Day fighting with Hiranyaksha. Hiranyaksha has a golden crown, he's got a white beard. He's got golden ornaments, he's got a sword and bra. He's standing on his hind legs and he's got the, the form of a boar. Right? And so the devotee's selling this book and he's telling this man in the airport, this is about good destroying evil, God destroying evil. And the guy looks at the book, book and he goes, why is God fighting a pig? And the devotee goes, no, no, God is the pig. <laughs> So these books are not for people. Yeah. You understand? They're not for people. No, no, God is the people. But Bhagavatam was one of the main books being distributed. It's like they can't understand because 
they just can't understand what happened out of necessity and what should be the standard. And they're still trying to distribute Bhagavatams to people who are not even devotees yet. Bhagavad Gita, Ishopanishad, Science of Self-Realization, there were some composite books, really good ones, great for the people. And even some of them were like, whoa, Bhagavad Gita, take this home and read it, Johnny. It's like, you know, huge books, you know. Okay, it's not there. Yeah, we'll see it on the, the cover. cover. Maybe it's yeah. inside. Yeah, it's books. probably yeah. on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. But it's there. It's a famous painting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're in the universe and they're, fi they're fighting. And I said, no, no. Why is God fighting a pig? No, no. God is the pig. <laughs> <laughs> so, in our situation, harmony amongst devotees, I'm quite happy to see that. I, I don't perceive any conflicts of personalities here and I don't see everybody being one personality trying to imitate me or imitate Geary or imitate you're all very individual and that's the way it should be and naturally developing in Krishna consciousness but you can't sleep your way through you know naturally is a sleep your way through no that doesn't work you have to be enthusiastic you have to be up early you have to be chanting very important. You can sacrifice a little of the chanting, this and that, but you just let mold grow in your beads. That mold is going to grow in your head. It's going to grow in your heart. And it's going to end up in conflict. It's going to end up in doubt. It's going to end up in, in, in all the things that are pulling towards the, the material energy and disturbing the community. So that is a super important aspect. I'm always reminding the devotees that are with me, make sure you're chanting, don't forget to say your gayatri. Those of you who have gayatri, say your gayatri. Don't neglect these things. They are super important.